All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm welcome, you guys. Uh, good morning to all of you coming in early in the morning to watch a fun presentation about shipwrecks. Um, my name is Ann Moser. I do education and I'm also a librarian for Wisconsin Sea Grant. I do a lot of education around Great Lakes literacy and I love this topic. I love shipwrecks. We're going to talk about stories of adventure, stories of disaster, weather, all kinds of stuff. So, um, and midway through, I'm going to really ask you to sort of shed your pretense and get, um, be part of the event. So I know we're in the virtual world, but we try to make this as involved as possible. So in your, where you're at home with whomever you are, get involved and um, I'll give you some ideas to, of things to do as we go along. So uh, what I like to do when I'm gonna do a shipwreck program is, um, let's see, oh, there we go. Start with Hollywood, right? Because a lot of stories come from Hollywood and I think everybody knows the story of the Titanic, the, the tragic, it's the most famous shipwreck in the world. Um, and, you know, in fact, it's this beautiful love story. We know that Jack and Rose meet on the ship and all kinds of things happen. And so, yes, it is a great Hollywood movie based on a real event, but the actual story of the Titanic is very interesting. Um, the ship was built in the early 1900s, a really long time ago. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, it was the largest ship in, at that moment in time. They'd never built a ship this large. It was very fancy, just like what you saw in the movie, very fancy. It had swimming pools and elevators and fancy ballrooms, just like what we saw in the Titanic. Um, and, you know, that's a new, that was unusual back in the day because today we're kind of used to some nice luxurious places like that, um, but it was unusual. Now, it was famous uh, because its owner, his name was Joseph Ismay, he said to everybody, come join the Titanic, come on its maiden voyage. It's unsinkable. Oops, well, we kind of know that that was kind of not the right thing to say. So the Titanic was built over here in Southampton, England, um, and its maiden voyage was to start on April 10th. 1912, so gosh, more than 100 years ago. And it was to set sail in the North Atlantic. So in the really, 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 really cold waters, very deep waters of the North Atlantic. Um, and its destination was New York City. Like what a great place to have its maiden voyage, right? Um, I'm sure you're probably wondering about this little push pin. We'll get to that in a moment. So this is where the Titanic was going on its voyage. And I meant to say in the beginning, as I do my presentation and chat with you, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat in YouTube. And at the very end, my colleague and friend Ginny will gather those questions. So if you have any questions as we go along, we'll make sure we get those answered at the end. All right, so here is that, look at that gorgeous ship. Isn't she beautiful, very large. Um, she sets sail. It's a very quiet, uneventful journey. Not, not too much to report, just a lot of parties and dancing and whatever, whatnot. Um, now, two days in, in the night, it was a beautiful night, no weather to be spoken of. Um, 11.40 p.m., the Titanic meets this. And this is actually a photograph of the iceberg that they're pretty sure that the Titanic ran into it. You can't see it because I've blown it really up, but apparently in the original, in the archives, there's pictures of, you can see in the picture, little pieces of paint as you go along. Um, so they think they're pretty sure that this is the iceberg that the um, Titanic ran into. Um, we don't we don't know 100% why it happened. You know, they, they talk about speed or, you know, maybe the, the, they were so confident in the technology because it was this new unsinkable Titanic, possibly human error. There's a lot of reasons it could happen. Um, but we do know tragedy struck. 1,500 crew and um, passengers lost their lives. There were over 2,200. So thankfully we did have um, some people survived the wreck. 
Now we know the story of the Titanic because we were able to capture first person accounts. And this is one example. Doesn't it look cool? It looks kind of like from a, um, from a magazine or a, or a comic book. But Mr. Skidmore down there, you can see on the right hand um, corner, he was on the SS Carpathia. That was the ship that saved the um, survivors of the Titanic. And he interviewed a person named Jack Thayer. Maybe the same Jack in the movie, we don't know. He was a young man, 17 years old, and he interviewed them and he took notes and he drew drawings of what happened. So they can see on this little document, time points, what happened, which direction, the ship no, uh, uh, sunk. Now, this is really important because we know the story of the shipwreck through these firsthand accounts. That's really, really important. Um, and now we there's there's the movie, there's photos, there's drawings. So having those first person accounts has just opened up everyone's eyes and to really understand the story of the Titanic. So it went down at 2 a.m., tragedy. The last person who was on the Titanic died in 2009. Her name was Melvina Dean, and she was just an itty bitty baby when the Titanic tragedy. She was a baby on the ship. She was rescued. Um, so we learned a lot from the Titanic, a lot of super important lessons, including the importance of safety equipment. So this photograph shows the people being rescued from the Titanic. And you can kind of see they're wearing these like funny white jackets. Those are life, life vests like we wear today. And they're in this like, I swear that boat to me looks like it would sink. And it's got these really big oars, but this over 700 people that were rescued were in these uh, boats. But the problem was there was not enough rescue um, equipment on the Titanic. There wasn't enough seats in those boats. There wasn't enough jackets. That's pretty well known. But what we don't often think of is that what happened with the Titanic has led to really great safety and um, protocols in the United States and around the world. So I never, this is me in my kayak, I never get in a, in a boat ever without a life jacket. I imagine if you're under the age of 10 or 12 or 14, a parent, a grandparent, a friend is to put your life jacket on. And that is a lesson we learned from the Titanic. So really, really, really important. Now, something else that resulted from the Titanic tragedy is something you might not be as familiar with, but there's like this amazing technology that was developed because of the Titanic tragedy. So I said that the Titanic went down in 1912 and it wasn't found till 1986. So in the beginning, I said it was 12,000 feet of water, super duper, 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 duper cold. It was, they couldn't find it until a very famous oceanographer, his name is Dr. Robert Ballard. So if you're interested in learning about an awesome hero of mine who does amazing oceanographic research, get a book out of the library. He is amazing. So he, he was doing all this really great science and he was also kind of a, a shipwreck hunter. He wanted to find the Titanic. So he had done a lot of work trying to find it and he was on this mystery military um, trip. And he said to these, uh, the people that were leading the voyage, he's like, can I look for the Titanic while I'm out there? And in fact, they were able to find it in 1986. Now, really deep waters, couldn't get at it. So because he's a very uh, motivated shipwreck hunter, he created a piece of technology that has transformed oceanographic research. It's called a remotely operated vehicle. It has also transformed shipwreck exploration. So I think a lot of you may have heard of an underwater or a, a, a drone you know, they're kind of a cool thing. Everybody wants them for Christmas. Well, this is an underwater drone. So it is able to travel by itself in these really cold waters, really deep waters and collect photos, data, et cetera. So this ROV, which um, Dr. Ballard named after his son, the Jason Jr., um, it has transformed a lot of things. And um, we, because of the, the footage from the ROV, we have amazing photographs of the Titanic. 
Um, this photograph I just put up is the place that Jack and Rose were standing in the movie on the front of the ship. Now, ROVs today are like the can be the size of a, a car and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is the next generation of the Jason, um, comes out of Woods Hole in Massachusetts, does amazing science. And because of this technology, we know so much about what's underwater. So we can thank Dr. Ballard for that. So shipwrecks, they teach us a lot. They're considered time capsules, which means they're a photograph at that moment. They teach us what was going on at that moment. So I put some stuff up here that we can learn from. Obviously, if there's loss of life, we can see clothing or personal effects. We can learn about weather patterns, trends, storms, water currents. There's so much that they can teach us. So that's why it's really important to include the study of shipwrecks. Now, we need to put our, you know, close our backs, turn our backs on the Atlantic Ocean because we live in the in or near the Great Lakes watershed. And boy, we have maritime history that is beautiful. There are more than 6,000 shipwrecks estimated to be in the Great Lakes. So that's a lot of shipwrecks over the five Great Lakes. In, in the waters that are part of Wisconsin, so that would be in Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, there are more, at least more than 720. It's, it's a number that changes often because we, we don't know all the stories like we know about the Titanic. Um, but only, only 120 of them have been identified and documented. So there's still many, many, many shipwreck stories that are out there. Now, if you're an adult like me, you know the song about the most famous shipwreck in the Great Lakes. Um, it's from uh, a song by Gordon Lightfoot from like a million years ago. Um, and he wrote a song about the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. Now this was a new, uh, most of the shipwrecks in the Great Lakes are from the early 1900s, late 1800s. But this was a shipwreck in the 1970s, just over 45 years ago in Lake Superior. Um, it was very tragic because all of the lives were lost. Um, they called it the Mighty Fitz. It's a very large book, um, ship. It was, it was hauling taconite pellets from Duluth to Detroit and Toledo. Um, so it's interesting because all of the crew members died. They had a lot of communication with the ship until the point where it went silent and they don't exactly know what happened. But we do know about the Fitzgerald from diving, from the scuba divers, from the maritime archeologists. And you can kind of see they go down and they've drawn these drawings of what they, See, and when I was putting this PowerPoint together, I was like, that's kind of interesting. It looks like it's split in half. So we don't know exactly what happened. We have some, we have some theories because they were, they were reporting what was happening. They were telling what, what was happening to the ship, its vulnerabilities, but we don't really know. But we do know some lessons that we did learn is about weather. So this was November 10th, 1975, and we learned what a November gale is, which is a very unique uh, weather pattern, especially in the Great Lakes, that causes an amazing change suddenly with a lot of winds. And so this, is the, this was the route of the Edmund Fitzgerald. There is its um, point where it went down, where it is now located on the bottom of Lake Superior. And this is the weather pattern that was that day. So you can see, you know, if you ever watch TV and watch the news and the meteorologist has all these arrows, this is kind of what you're seeing. These are different, um, uh, uh, different um, aspects, data about the weather that day. So we do know that this November gale is a phenomena and we, we are aware of it and the dangers that it can provide. But most of what we know about the fits is very limited. It's, it really remains a mystery. Um, so that's kind of an interesting side, but for years, there are a lot of stories we do know. And so for years, I love stories and I wanted to do work and teach about shipwrecks. I work a lot with children, as you can probably already tell. And so I wanted to do a program. I don't like scuba diving, like I could never do this work, but I love talking about it and learning about it and sharing it with everyone. So I have a good friend named Tori, Tori Kiefer. 
She was a maritime archaeologist with the Historical Society, the Wisconsin Historical Society. And I said to Tori, I said, Tori, I want to do a program. I want to do something to teach about this. And she said, okay. So we had a great team, teamwork. We did a lot of um, uh, brainstorming on what we could do. And she said, okay, well, I have a shipwreck that you could use as the basis of it. And I was like, great. And she said, there's three reasons why. She said, one, she thinks it's kind of an interesting story. I said, okay. And two, she's a, what they call a boat nerd. She loves all kinds of different boats and vessels and ships. And she said, oh, it's a really cool boat, which I don't know if you can see is behind me. And the third reason she said, well, I'm not going to tell you what the third reason is, because I'm going to see if we can observe that and, and kind of notice, make observations about it. So those were the three things she said. I was like, all right. So the one thing she did say, she said, before you start, always take only pictures, leave only bubbles. That is a very important mantra. You cannot remove anything from a shipwreck. They are protected. They are owned by the state of Wisconsin, by all of us. And these stories they collect about a ship would be ruined if you started to take parts out of it. So in the mid eighties, they, they created a law that protects those shipwrecks. So you can be a scuba diver, a, you can go in the near shore, right near the coast and dive and look at the shipwrecks. You can look at them, no problem. Just always leave them and never touch them. All right, so our ship today is the Silver Lake, right? cool name. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go in a time machine. I hope you'll uh, uh, get involved now. This is where I want audience participation. So this is going to be our ship. It's called the Silver Lake. And our first thing is to take a trip in the time machine. Okay. So what I need you to do is everyone cover their eyes and I'm going to say, don't peek, no peeking. I'm going to say abracadabra, I love pizza. Well, welcome. It's the summer of 2008, and we are all maritime archaeologists working for the Wisconsin Historical Society. The maritime archaeologist is our job. Way cool. So, and you can open your eyes now. Yes, you can open your eyes. Thanks, Ginny. Um, the phone rings. Ding-a-ling-a-ling, ding-a-ling-a-ling, ding-a-ling-a-ling. Hello? Oh, oh, it's Susie. Oh, Susie. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, you found a shipwreck. Oh, wow, that is a cool shipwreck. Thanks for sending that photo. Yes, we'll go investigate it. Okay. All right. So we have a ship to investigate. So the first place we're going to go is the library. It kind of surprised you, I bet. But the first job of maritime archaeology archaeologists is to do research. And just to remind you, that term maritime means water, sea, ocean, Great Lakes, and archaeologist means studying of past evidence. Okay, so I forgot to tell you what that was. All right, so we're at the library and it's our time to gather up our documents. So we're going to find newspaper articles, we're going to find any first, first hand accounts like what we had with the Titanic. We're going to find this document, which I just learned about as a maritime archaeologist, called the Certificate of Enrollment. It's like an identification paper for the, for the ship. So if you change anything about the ship, you get a new Certificate of Enrollment. They change ships a lot, which kind of surprised me. So I'm getting all these documents all gathered up, and we do a lot of research, and we try to form as much of the story from these documents as possible. All right, so we did our research. The next step, oh, before we get going, I wanted to tell you that we found a picture, not of the Silver Lake in the, in the library and archives, but we did find a picture of a scow schooner. And that's what we think this ship is. And you can kind of see it's got some mass and some rigging, also known as the ropes. They, the sailors call it rigging. Um, but what's interesting, I think, about the ship is that it's kind of square. It's kind of like a bathtub. And apparently, I think, what I'm learning is these are ships that haul a lot of cargo with them. They take a bunch of stuff from one place to another. And so you can see, this is the photograph that Susie sent to us. And you can kind of see, I would say, I think I agree with that assessment. 
All right, so are you guys ready? Because guess what? It's time, we've done our research in 2008 and it is time to go into the time machine again. All right, so everybody close your eyes, close them tight. And I'm gonna say, Abracadabra, I love broccoli. Welcome, open your eyes. It is May 27, 1900. And I am here as your captain. My name is Samuel Martin. My name is Captain Samuel Martin. And I have with me my first mate. His name is Henry Eastman. Say hello, Henry, give a wave. Hello, Henry. All right, there's Henry. Henry says hello. And the rest of you on the call are all seamen. So we have seaman Sigwald Anderson. We have seaman Ollie Williamson. And that boat is not exactly our boat, but it's kind of what it should look like. So we have a scow schooner and it's, it was built in 1889. It was sold a few times and is now owned by Mr. Nels Johnson. He lives down in Racine. And so he would like us to take a haul of maple lumber. A lot of money. He wants us to take that haul of lumber down to its home port in Racine. So I'm hiring all of you. Now you guys are all pretty new sailors. So just a little more information. Um, you know, in fact, I'm not a cursed captain. I, I just wanted to let you know, I, I have had a couple of, um, uh, just a couple of things happen. You know, I, I had a couple of crashes and, um, you know, actually one time the, the ship ran aground, but I'm not cursed. No, it's fine. It, it's, it's all going to be good. So, but you're my crew and welcome aboard, right? So before we start, since you guys are mostly new crew members, I think we need to review our vocabulary. So one important thing that happens on a vessel is I yell, as the captain, I yell, master. And then you guys respond saying, master. It's all called call and response. Really important. Whenever I give you a command, you repeat it. So let's try it at home. Muster. Muster. Very good. And that means when I call muster, everybody comes together. Every single person, no one can be missing because one of the purposes of our muster is to make sure we haven't lost anybody. So we make a countdown, we go one, two, three, four, five, or maybe 30, 29, 28, 11. Anyway, you count, make sure we haven't lost any time, anybody. So that's a really important thing about being on my vessel. And you have to, if you don't come up, if you're sound asleep in your bunk, we'll think you're lost. And then that creates a whole new problem. All right. Another thing is if I tell uh, my first mate, Mr. Eastman, to, to clean the head, clean the bathroom, he will immediately say, aye, aye, sir. And aye, 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 sir. Very good, thank you, first mate. And the thing is, it's kind of weird. Why do you say I twice? I means you heard me, and I the second time means, of course, I'll get to that right away. So if I say to Henry Eastman, time to clean the head, Mr. Eastman, she says. Aye, aye, sir. Very good, thank you, good crew person there. All right, so another word, avast. I just love this word, I had to include it, stop. Avast. So this just reminds me that I don't really understand why this isn't a little aside, why sailing has all its own words. They have a whole vocabulary. Kind of crazy. All right. One more term that is really, we won't need this. It's not necessary. But if someone yells abandon ship, you abandon ship no matter what. You don't pick up your bag. You don't find your iPad. Oh, no, there's no iPad. You don't get anything. You just get off that ship as soon as possible, but we don't need that. It, 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 it's not important. All right, so we're gonna get started on our voyage. So the first thing I'm gonna do is call muster. Muster. Very good, so it's night now. Um, tomorrow morning, we're gonna get started. So I wanted to just tell you about our voyage. We are up here in Eagle Harbor near Ephraim, and we're gonna travel up and over the Dorp Peninsula down through Lake Michigan with our haul of maple lumber, bringing it to Mr. Johnson in, in Racine, Wisconsin. So, so far the weather looks good. It can always change on Lake Michigan. Um, just something to keep in mind. We do know that the Pere Marquette is traveling at night across Lake Michigan and winding up there in, in Manitowoc. It's a, it's a large ship, so just keep that in mind, okay? 
So my, uh, my advice to you is to go down. Um, oh, okay. We wake up the next day and we are ready to sail. Oh my goodness. It is a beautiful day on Lake Michigan. Just gorgeous. Um, having a great time, smooth sailing. Now, as the day went on, on May 27th, 1900, today, the fog started to roll in and it got pretty heavy. So it is now nighttime and you know what I'm gonna do? Muster. Muster. Very good. Thank you, crew. Well, it's nighttime and I think you need some rest. We got a long day tomorrow. So I would ask that you guys head downstairs. You've had a nice meal from our cook and time to hit your bunk and head to bed. Now, first mate, Mr. Eastman will be on watch. Now, I think I didn't tell you before, but remember, we don't have any fancy equipment on our boat. It's pretty simple. So Mr. Eastman will be on watch and he will be using his eyes and his ears to listen for any problems. So watch is really important. So you guys are all tucked in nice and warm in your bed and Mr. Eastman will be on watch. He's got his scope to watch what's going on and hopefully he brought his really good listening ears. He's listening really carefully. So everyone's sleeping. Mr. Eastman is on watch, doing a great job. We can always rely on Mr. Eastman. And the fog is heavy. It's very heavy. So we know the only way that we can know what's out there is from sound because we can't see anything. And we hear in the distance, quietly, the sound of a fog. <coughs> and Eastman starts to get concerned and it's <coughs> getting louder. And as we travel, it's getting louder. <coughs> Oh my God, it's on top of us. Uh, oh my God. Uh, there it is. Ah. Uh, ship, abandoned ship, abandoned ship, abandoned ship, because look what the, that is really not cool. Here we go, everybody. Abandoned ship, abandoned ship, abandoned ship, abandoned ship, abandoned ship. Oh, Mr. Eastman, you saved the crew, but you lost your life. Through your bravery, our crew is saved. And there it is. So tragic. All right. We need to get, we need to get back in time because this is so upsetting. So everybody, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes because it's time again for the time machine. And it's time for me to say abracadabra. I love ice cream. Open your eyes. Welcome. It's back to the summer of 2008. And we are maritime archaeologists. Here we are. We're starting to think about going for a dive. Um, I love this because I see us in our really, really cool um, clothing that we wear. We have this awesome wetsuit, dry suit even. Um, we, we can see our oxygen tanks and our regulators. And what's really cool is this. It is a board holding waterproof paper and a waterproof pencil that we can draw with underwater because we are going down and we are going to take a look at the Silver Lake. Very cool. So we're going to take a lot of measurements. You can see there's a really long measuring tape. We're over here drawing pictures. So when we're down there, we're drawing a lot of pictures on graph paper, taking a lot of measurements. Really, really important, because when we get back to the hotel tonight, we're gonna be super tired, but we're gonna use that late at night, draw lots of pictures. So when we were down looking at the Silver Lake, we took a lot of photographs. Look at that, there she is. Now, I think you can see us taking our measurements with the long measuring tape. You can see the hatch. Maybe if you pe peered really, really, closely, you might see some lumber in there. It's kind of hard to see. Um, and here is the is us. That's us, the maritime archaeologist. Kind of gives you a sense of the size of the vessel. There she is again. There we are doing our work. And you can kind of see the mass. Some of the mass have fallen down. Again, the hat. And look at this. When I look at this, I wonder if that's the point of impact of the pear marquette. Here we are again. Do you remember? 
Do you remember when we were doing our research that it was very square? So I can confirm, I think that this is a scow schooner. Very cool. And I think we need to remember our friend Tori, when she was talking about it being a very unusual boat, it's a scow schooner, but do you see this thing I've circled? It's called a centerboard. And the Silver Lake is the only shipwreck in the whole Great Lakes that have ever been found that had this um, centerboard. So it's very unusual. Now we haven't quite figured out what the other thing is about this shipwreck. So let's keep our eyeballs peeled. Now I love this photo. We, we took a really good shot here because you can kind of see, I think, the point of impact. You see that? It looks like that might have been where the ship ran into it. So we are taking so many photographs now. We're taking them from the side. We're taking them from this way. And one thing we are is we're taking them on top. So we're getting a bird's eye view as well. All right. So here we go. I want you to look at this. See the side of the ship? I think this photograph we took is really great because it shows the invasive muscles that have clung to the ship pretty cool. Oh, wait, did Ginny, did you do that? Who circled that? Oh my gosh, my machine must have a, a little mouse in it. I don't know. Somebody circled that. Who knows why? Okay. Here we are again, another view. Look at this, the front of the ship. You can see the rope, the rigging. Um, wait, who is, who is circling that? I, oh my gosh. I don't know what's happening. I think there must be a mouse in my computer. I really like this picture. You could see how tiny we are compared to the um, Silver Lake. Oh, okay. This is getting completely ridiculous. Somebody is taking over. Maybe it's Liz or oh, I don't know what's happening. Okay. We'll just ignore that circle. I'm not really sure why. Now I told you we take photographs from the bird's eye view. The birds are above it. So we're looking down on the shipwreck. And I love this. We took a zillion photographs and put them all together, sewed them together to create what's called a photo mosaic. And you can see it says Scow Schooner, Silver Lake, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, 2008. Do you remember we were in the time machine? Pretty cool. And I think what you can see here is really, really well, the point of impact. So I think when we look at these photographs, we can begin to tell the story of the Silver Lake, how it got impacted, boom, by this really large pear marquette. All right. So another thing that we make, I told you before that late at night, we take our drawings and we draw what we see and we create what's called dive slates. And dive slates are awesome. You can take them underwater. There are these really sturdy plastic, um, uh, well, maybe like four by eight. Um, and they, you go down with them if you're a scuba diver. And I told you, you can't touch the shipwrecks, but you can investigate them and swim all around. And you can use a dive slate to know what you're looking at because they've marked what things are. Really fun thing. Oh my goodness, here we are back again. Um, so I was kind of joking around, but um, my friend Tori said, it's very, very unusual for a shipwreck to go down. And, oh, I don't know, over a hundred years later to find the mast still standing. So she said that that's a very unusual aspect of the shipwreck. So that's why, I guess that's why my computer was uh, trying to tell me, remind me to tell you that. All right, it's 2008. We really got, I don't want to leave anybody behind. So let's go ahead and take the trip back because oh, I'm tired. All right, everybody, cover your eyes and take a trip in the time machine. And abracadabra, I love shipwrecks. Open up. I hope everybody's back from 2008 because that would be tragedy to leave you there. Um, thank you for helping me tell the story of the Silver Lake. I just want to wrap up with a couple of things that if you enjoy shipwrecks, we have lots of things for you to look at to learn more. So one of the things that you should run to right away is the wisconsinshipwrecks.org website. It's awesome. It has the story of the Silver Lake and another hundreds of other stories about, you can see where they're located. You can see who the history that they know about them. It's really, really awesome. 
Um, definitely. And I shared with Science Expeditions um, this sheet. I should have put it on the internet, but I forgot. So Jesse, I think Liz is um, Liz Jesse is making it available in the chat on YouTube. But it's, all, it's in the it's in the chat right now. So all right, thank you, Liz. <laughs> you bet. Um, so anything I've talked about today is referenced on this sheet, and so you can see information about Wisconsin shipwrecks, the Titanic. You can learn more about Robert Ballard. There are books for children on there. Lots of fun resources if you're interested in learning more. Now, if you're interested in doing more virtual stuff, the Historical Society that I was, we were maritime archeologists where we worked, they've been doing a lot of virtual events. So like their page on Facebook and follow them. And they have some really, the, the, the true maritime archeologists like Tori have been doing amazing programs and they dive really deep into the story of one shipwreck, for example. And then um, Wisconsin Sea Grant, where I am, um, has a couple of really fun lessons for families. So this deep dive into shipwreck stories takes you to the wisconsinshipwrecks.org website and you do a little scavenger hunt and a crossword puzzle. It's really fun. So it's a fun thing to do as a family. And then we just put out, I mentioned about the invasive mussels. We just put out some information with some YouTubes and other stuff to learn about what mussels, what invasive species species that are not native to the Great Lakes might, how they may be impacting our shipwreck resources. So lots and lots of stuff to look at if you're interested. Um, and then, oh, just one other thing. Tomorrow, I believe it's at 1215, the Historical Society archeologists are actually gonna do a program. And I think there's a rumor that they may show up in their full equipment, wetsuit, dry suits, all that stuff. So if it's something you want to check out, I think it's at 1215, but check the schedule for sure. And then finally, I want to thank Science Expeditions for having us today and to all of you for coming because it's a real pleasure because I love shipwrecks. I'm sure you're, my enthusiasm showed, but I do appreciate you guys coming aboard and, and taking a listen. So I thank you. Miigwech. Gracias. Merci. Kia ora. And I don't have the pronunciation for my other three languages, but to everyone, whatever your language is, thank you very much for listening. Um, and then my colleague, Ginny, I'm going to stop sharing. If there's any questions, we can definitely, we have a few minutes. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. No questions? Ginny, was there anything in the chat? So we don't have questions in the chat, but we have some great resources in the chat um, that you have shared and also links to tomorrow's uh, science expedition programming that's happening both today and tomorrow. So check out all the different options available. Um, and if you do have questions, we're going to hang on for a little bit longer. So please go, go ahead and um, type them into the chat and we'll try to pass them on to Anne for you. And thanks again. Here's some questions coming in now. So the first question is, can you tell us the status of the National Maritime Sanctuary? Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, so the paperwork has been submitted. It's a uh, federal state part partnership for a sanctuary. Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is a federal agency that um, takes care of our coasts and our Great Lakes, um, they are the lead. And so they have a program called the National Marine Sanctuary Program, and they find places that are along the coast that are of significance. So it could be um, a habitat for a particular um, species, for, for perhaps like manatees or a certain type of fish. And they create areas for um, called a sanctuary where they are um, protected. And then also lots and lots of education like this can happen. So because we have such a rich 
um, archaeology, marine archaeology, maritime archaeology in the Great Lakes, it's been proposed. There's a there's a sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan, Thunder Bay. Check it out. So many cool resources about shipwrecks in that northern part of Michigan. Um, and we have one proposed in Lake Michigan. Um, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on the on the area, but it's about uh, two rivers down to Port Washington, something like that. And it's been proposed as a sanctuary, and it's gone through many legal processes and up the chain of command and is now with the president. So with the change of administration, it hasn't been signed yet, but I, I, I imagine it's in their hands. Um, the president has it in his office somewhere, probably file folder sitting there waiting for signature, and then um, it will go forward. Thank you for that question. And so with our last uh, two or three minutes, we have a couple more questions that we hope to get to. The first is, um, are the barnacles and mussels damaging? Do you worry about loss of these artifacts? Yeah, um, that's a great question, actually. And Ginny, um, Liz said we can stay on and answer questions even past the 45 minutes. That's a really, really, really great question. Um, so there's a lot of things that go on with mussels that impact the um, shipwrecks. So when we describe wanting to protect them for posterity's sake so that we can do the research and to make sure that we understand the stories, in the, the muscles impact them in a couple of ways. We probably don't know the full story of the impact, but a couple of things we do know is muscles have this incredible filtering. So they can turn over the water, they can filter out Lake Michigan. I'm trying to remember what, how quickly it is, like in two days, or I, I don't, don't quote me on that. It's really fast. And so what's happening with Lake Michigan, if you've been, have, had the opportunity to visit there, the water is getting very clear. And there's been news articles where you can actually see shipwrecks from planes. So the clarity of the water is, is getting, it's getting way clearer, which, you know, in some ways you think is a good thing, but it, it takes the food web, the very complicated symbiotic relationship of everything in the water, and it kind of makes it a little goofy. And so what's happening then is sunlight is able to hit the shipwrecks. It probably would degrade, because these are mostly, I didn't mention, but mostly very old ships from the 1800s and early 1900s. Most of them in that era are obviously uh, made of wood. So that's one thing. And then just having those muscles adhere to the shipwrecks will erode um, the wood. So as you can imagine, it can't be good. Um, you know, they really, maritime archeologists who are experts in this, I am not obviously, um, they want the shipwrecks to remain as intact as possible. And we're lucky in the Great Lakes because the water is very cold. So shipwrecks can become really true capsules that won't change a lot because the water is so cold, um, but the, the muscles are changing that. So I hope that answers your question. So you had just mentioned that the water is really cold. And we had a question before you mentioned that asking, how cold is the water? <laughs> okay, I'm a librarian first and I would have to go online to look, but <laughs> um, oh boy, that's a good question. Um, like in the summer, I don't think it gets more than like Michigan. What do you think, Jenny? 50 or 60 or 60 degrees maybe? Seems about right. And then obviously it gets really cold in the winter because ice can form on top. A lot of like, you know, um, a lot of shipwrecks. So with the Titanic, for example, this is like a sidebar, but the Titanic was in really deep, really cold weather. So it was actually well preserved, except for the disaster that happened because it got hit, hit that and it kind of broke in two and it fell. The ocean currents created like kind of a big um, shipwreck field at the bottom of the ocean, but, but the cold, preserved what was down there. So, you know, I often do this program and kids will ask me, well, are the dead bodies down there? And um, yes, in fact, um, a shipwreck is considered a graveyard. So cold water will keep it in good shape. If it's in warm water, many people like to look for shipwrecks in the Caribbean and the warm waters, so they don't have to wear wetsuits and dry suits. Um, but those shipwrecks are more fragile. So um, for some reason, it, it just, we're lucky in that it preserves it. So um, 
but yeah, I, I, as a librarian, I have, I would have to go to the, the atmospheric sciences department at UW Madison and get that data for you. It's not at the tip of my tongue, <laughs> but thanks for that question. Water temperature is really important when it comes to shipwrecks though, just that point. And perhaps you have some own personal information if you've ever had the good fortune of going into one of the great lakes or another lake you'll know that the water near the shore tends to be warmer because it's shallower than water further out so maybe you felt that yourself mm -hmm. that if you stay right near the beach um, your ankles are and feet are kind of warm but if you go further out and into deeper water the water gets colder with the depth and that's because the sunlight has a harder time reaching um, the bottom of the water as the water gets deeper and it's the sunlight that's helping to warm the water um, in the great lakes and that you know again Ginny, good point because it relates to the ability of the clarity of the water bringing the sun down deeper as we go right. forward. Yeah. And one of our um, participants has said that they think that the water temperature stays about 39 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius, even in the summer in the deeper parts of the lake. Yeah, so that would probably. be quite cold. Yes, that would be very cold. <laughs> Thanks for that question. And that is the remainder of the questions that I see in the chat at the moment. And we are at about time. If you do have additional questions for us, please go ahead and email Anne at um, akmoser at aqua.wisc.edu. And we hope you had a good uh, time with us and we'll let Anne wrap it up for us. Yeah, just um, enjoy the rest of science expeditions. There are so many wonderful programs. Get out, um, enjoy nature. Um, and if you ever want to give it a go um, and you have the opportunity to go to Lake Michigan along the coast, you can you can look at the wisconsinshipwrecks.org website and find what they call near shore shipwrecks. And you can go to these communities. I think there's one right off of Sheboygan and you can just be right, even not even in the water and see the shipwrecks. It's really exciting to see those um, in person. You know, this was a fun story, but to see them there and know there's this amazing story underwater right in front of you is pretty amazing. So thank you so much for, um, uh, thank you so much for coming everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks and, and enjoy the expeditions.